You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast series, which syndicates for the A-List online. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I have yet another legendary interview subject coming up for you. This time around, it is Jim Reed from the Jesus and Mary Chain. The reason for the conversation is to promote the band's March Tour of Australia. I'll read out some dates. The first one, as soon as I can find the gig poster. Here it is. Thursday the 7th, they are playing in Sydney. Friday the 8th, Brisbane. Tuesday the 12th, Melbourne. Friday the 15th, Adelaide. And Perth, you get a show on Saturday the 16th. So let's have a listen to what Jim has to say. Here we go. All right, good. Thanks. How have the, uh, how have the phoners been treating you with the Australian media types? Uh, just started. Um, only done two so far. So, yeah, so oh, far God. so good. Yeah, way too early, mate. I noticed you got three days of it, so good luck. <laughs> Sorry. I'm sure they'll be good, mate. I'm sure they'll be fine because we are here to talk about your Australian tour, okay, which is happening yeah. through March. God, I had to think about that, I think, didn't I? But you are playing in Brisbane at the Tivoli, which is a wonderful uh, venue, i got to say, for you guys to be playing. I'm so glad when I saw that you guys were playing in that venue rather than the other one across the town, which is called the Trifford, which just doesn't lend itself, I don't think, to the sort of music that you are so famous for producing. So, mate, in your own words, can you describe the sort of show you'll be bringing down? Um, if you are into the Mary Chain, then hopefully you shouldn't be disappointed. We're going to be doing some songs from each period. Probably every album should be represented, Great. including yep. uh, Damage and Joy. Um There'll be a there'll be a bunch of stuff that people. I mean, we're not going to come out and and start doing a twenty minute obscure B sides or whatever. There'll be mm. stuff that people know and hopefully enjoy. What about the cut that made the the Crow soundtrack? Now I can't think of it off the top of my head now as I'm talking to you. Sorry, I should have done my research and found out the name of the cut, but I must have listened to that many many yeah, times. I think yeah, Snake Driver, I think that was. That's it, Snake Driver. That's the one. I I ended up getting into you guys and the Thrill Thrill Kill Cult through that particular soundtrack. So do you get a lot of that feedback for people of my vintage in their 40s? Uh, what, you mean feedback from that particular album, you mean? Yeah, or just from that episode. Because I wasn't, to be honest, I wasn't. For, I didn't know about you guys up until I watched the movie and then procured well, yeah, the soundtrack. Yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah. I mean, that, that is... You know, the great thing about doing things like that is that you kind of uh, get across to a bunch of people that might not otherwise have heard your music. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's the same way. I mean, we, we did very well indeed out of, uh, you know, Just Like Honey being used in Lost in Translation. Yes. I mean, a lot of people discover the band through that. So, mm. um, yeah, bring it on. More, more of that, really, you know. I mean, yeah. anything to get the message across. All good by us. Yeah, what what happened if you don't mind me asking after Stoned and Dethroned? Because I honestly thought you guys were were set to, if not take over the world. You know that the music world had opened up at that point with Nirvana, the Smashing Pumpkins, and that sort of music. And you'd worked with a lot of the the people that produced and really helped create that sound, in my view. In Flood and um, Mulder, I think it was you worked with as well very early on. But did you guys just decide to go your separate ways after Stoned and Dethroned? Well, we we stoned and dethroned. Um, uh, we still did monkeys. So um, basically, I mean, we 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 internally the band was um, was struggling a bit. I mean, I, I, my relationship with my brother was like uh, was was far from ideal. Mm. Um, at the time, the whole in Britain, the whole Brit pop thing was kicking off, and for some reason or other, uh, it kind of left us behind, uh, which I always thought was a bit weird, because a lot of Agreed. the that, that came yeah. up were, were kind of, uh, you know, into the Mary chain, but it, for, for reasons that I, I can't even be bothered to try and examine, it, it, we, we were left rather uh, marginalised by the whole uh, musical movement, so combination of those two things, really, the band was imploding, and... Uh, yeah. The music scene was uh, changing, and uh, we seemed to be in a bad place uh, all round. So it kind of it was it was a bad time for the Mary Chain. We, we were, yeah, you know, it, it just seemed as if that you know there was no there was.
there's no kind of um, relief from <laughs> the, yeah. the all round sort of like a, you know shit storm that seems to be going on all around us. Yeah, which is which is interesting because this is this is my take on it. Okay, I don't think, and I'm talking not necessarily about the music, but the sound that emerged through the 90s, I don't think that would have been as present as what it was if it wasn't for you guys and the fact that Alan Mulder and Flood worked with you guys on Psycho Candy. I think they learnt a lot through that. So I always find it interesting that the godfathers in our in our rock and roll, punk, heavy metal, we seem to overlook them, including you guys. I'm putting you guys into that. And is that, Do you feel a similar um, sentiment to what I do around the fact that, okay, you did work with Alan Mulder and Flood very early on. And look, I do host a podcast series, so I want to release this on my podcast series. And for people listening, Alan Mulder worked with Nine Inch Nails and God knows how many other artists. And, and Flood was uh, Smashing Pumpkins and, and so many other artists. I don't even want to mention them because I'm going to miss out some other important ones. But all of these artists, the point is, they're synonymous with the sounds of the 90s. And my view is that if they didn't work with you guys on Psycho Candy, they wouldn't have learnt key tenets now, I could be completely wrong here, but this is my thoughts. They wouldn't have learnt key tenets that they carried with them throughout their career to help produce the wonderful music that they ended up helping with. Well, I think um, we all benefited out of um, you know, various roles. Less so Flood, because Flood only did one single with us. Right. He's a great guy, but, um, but we did have a relationship with Mulder. Uh, he did a few albums, uh, and it was great. And yeah, I mean, I'm sure that Alan would would agree that uh, that was a necessary, uh, you know, learning experience for him as well as us. Hmm. So yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's not really for us to see. I mean, people will hear. Yeah, I know. Music, I appreciate it. Yeah. Will. yeah, I know. Coming from a fan like I am's perspective, you know, as as a died in the wall music fan these are the thoughts that i have and it's i'm in a wonderful right, position right. where i can air my thoughts with the artist who's been at the center of it so so i tend to right, do right. that but uh what, what about this this statement here shoegaze of course you've been been synonymous with that if you go to wikipedia it says you know jesus and mary chain genre shoegaze and a few other things there but is that a term to embrace do you think or is it just an invention of eager journalists uh, it was an invention of, uh, I, I don't know which journalist, but an NME journalist made up that, 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 that whole, not, not genre, but um, the, the term was mm. made up by someone at the NME. So you kind of take it all with a, a barrel load of soul. I mean, what does it mean? I mean, I guess there were a bunch of bands around at that time that had a kind of similar attitude. And to me, what it means is there was a bunch of bands that, that Although they made great music, they didn't necessarily look that comfortable on stage. And we will, will certainly, uh, that certainly mm. describes the Mary Jane, but Ride, The Valentines, you know, Slow Dive. Yeah, there, there was a bunch of bands that just, that, that were, were doing interesting things sonically, but it just looked like, oh gosh, I'd rather not be, you know, why is everybody looking at me kind mm. of a thing. Yeah, yeah a bit like um, with uh, Joy Division. I think you guys are yeah. in, in that lineage. You've always, when I listen, when I want to listen to you guys, I tend to want to listen to Joy Division and New Order at the same time or in the same session, if you like. Right. You know, it's just. But the other, um, other cool thing that I only just found out when I was doing my research for our conversation was you did a tour or at least some shows with uh, Trent and Nine Inch Nails. So how did they come across? Yeah, I mean, it was great. I mean, <clears throat> it, was, it was a strange experience for us because they, they are. I mean, they're, they're just like massive in America, so it was strange to see how a tour like like that, you know, comes together. You know, it's just it was mm. a great, it was great. I mean, we played some fantastic shows that otherwise we couldn't have done. You know, playing like Red Rocks and stuff oh, like yeah, that, yeah. And Radio City Music Hall two nights in a row. It was, it was just an amazing experience, really. And those guys. They, I mean, just like us, really. I mean, they, 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 again, uncomfortable with the whole idea of show business, but they kind of like strangely find themselves. That is what they do. We're all in show business, mm. as 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 hard as that is to 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 come to terms with. That is ultimately that's what we do. Indeed, but, yeah. You know, but it, it's you know it, it, it's kind of it's a difficult one, and uh, I, I I I enjoyed the whole thing. So those shows were where Trent started to strip down 
the stage set up, I, I understand this. It, it was it used to be very technology laden. I suppose that's the only term I can use. But he started to make it more of a rock show. Was that your interpretation of what the Nine Inch Nails were doing when you were, were touring with them? Well, I mean, it, 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 it certainly is what, what what it was all about. I mean, I think that Trent had just looked around. Uh, what what other bands were doing, and it seemed to be what he was doing five years previously or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. to really, you know, to to kind of stand out, you almost have to go back to the start sometimes, and I think that's kind of like what yeah, what he was getting at. It's like strip yeah. it down to what, the, the bits that matter, because like really, at the end of the day, it's all about music and the guys on stage, I and mean, the rest of it's all just uh, window dressing, really. <laughs> indeed it is indeed it is so so your first album back after the hiatus after monkey which was released in 98 of course so i should have remembered that when i, I made the point there about stoned and dethroned but damage and joy did the damage and joy when it, when that was released did it do for you what you wanted it to do for you i.e did it connect with old fans and maybe bring in some new ones it seemed to i mean it seemed to do pretty well and um the great thing is that when you go out and play the songs from Damage and Joy, uh, the, the, you know, it's not... I mean, we, we're worried that you do the stuff that people aren't so familiar with. There's going to be a bit of a dip, a bit of a lull in the set. Hmm. But, that, I mean, that certainly is not what happens. We go out there and those songs just totally, totally, you know, blended with the, the rest of the catalogue, you know? yeah. Yeah, okay, and Youth was the producer, am I right in saying that? Yeah. What was it like reconnecting with him again? Or I suppose you guys have been mates and got along famously for many years, but what was it like to get back into the studio with someone like that? Well, I mean, we hadn't really met. Um, it was just, we had the idea to, well, we've never used a producer before. I mean, talking about like Flood and Alan Mulder, I mean, they, mm. they, they were engineering our records. We yeah. never actually used anyone as a producer. So we thought doing this record, it could be problematic, i.e. Monkey, you know, not the record that we'd made before was so difficult to make. We thought, well, maybe if we get somebody in the studio that's, you know, somebody else, you know, also we hadn't made a record for so long. Mm. You know, the process of making a record has changed so yes, much since yes. the last time that we had made yeah. an album. So we thought, get somebody in to help with the technology, get somebody in to maybe keep the peace of, of, of the shit hits the fan. <laughs> um, as it turns out, we, we didn't scream and shout at each other. We got on pretty well, so that part of it was unnecessary. But hmm. it was good to have a, another band member uh, you, you, that's, that's what a good producer is some a, t a temporary band member yes uh, and so it's someone that comes in with a, a kind of a, a fresh perspective and point of view and uh, that worked it worked pretty well it, we, we, the, I mean, the brief was like we're not interested in making a record that doesn't sound like the Mary Jane yeah. we want to actually take all of the elements of what, what what we've done with the Mary Jane and update it so he got that, and we achieved that, I think. So there you go. Yeah, cool. All right, look, I better make this my last question to let you go to the next one. But um, I've always wondered, and I no doubt it's probably out there, but I used to love saying the name and the Jesus Lizard. So I used to love saying the Jesus and Mary Chain and the Jesus Lizard when I was a kid in front of my very Catholic mother because she used to scold me for it. So I can only imagine there's a religious uh, reactive element in there in the fact that you've named it as such. But can you describe the, the how you came up with the name of the band? Well, I mean, it's, I wish there was a better story, but um, we used to make things up about where the name came from, but... Um, the truth is that William just thought of it one day. Okay. We actually had a gig, uh, and, but but we didn't have a name for the band, and so it was it, you know it was just getting ridiculous. We thought, well, fuck it, we're going to have to advertise this thing. We need a name. <laughs> and we'd even made these posters with a blank uh, at the the, the the bottom right hand corner where the name should be. Yes. And then William just sort of said, oh, what about the Jesus and Mary chain? And at first, everybody, it was one of those, like, it went from being ridiculous to brilliant within a, a couple of seconds yes. in your head. <laughs> you kind of thought, oh, that, that sounds utterly, and then you thought, well, wait a minute, you know, it sounds like no other band, you know, and it, 
It just sounded great, so we ran with that and never looked back. It's nothing to do. We we weren't trying to sort of push buttons and get on anybody's nerves. We just thought it sounded good. Mm, it does. Sounds awesome. Still sounds awesome, actually. Um, so I think congratulations on, or uh, well, your brother at least, on creating one of the, uh, well, you know, you had to also agree to it, so all of you, uh, on one of the best band names of all time and uh, made a better leave oh, it there. So you. so congratulations on a stellar career on, on influencing so many people and giving, you know, these wonderful producers and engineers a start or at least, you know, helping form the sounds through them that we all know and love through the 90s and beyond. So, and I hope this tour goes really well for you in, in Australia, of course, as well. well thank you. Thank, thanks very much. No worries, mate. All the best. Okay. Thank right. you. Bye. Bye. You have been listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast series, which syndicates for the A-List online. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith, and that interview subject you just listened to is Jim Reed from Scottish Legends, the Jesus and Mary chain. Thank you so much for listening.